Hello, everyone who is coming in for today's event. We are here for the virtual tour of intentional communities. And we have three wonderful presenters, each coming from different intentional communities across the United States, and also a nice diversity of different types of intentional communities. So my name is Cynthia, and I am one of the co-directors with the Foundation for Intentional Community, FIC. And I'm calling in from Vermont, where I live at an intentional community called Headwaters Eco Village in central Vermont. And yeah, it's, we're having beautiful summer weather here. So appreciating all of you for taking the time out of your days to tune into this session. And thank you so much to each of our presenters um, also for being here and sharing about your community. I'm so delighted to have each of you with us and um, you know, welcome Anne and Peter and Zarina. Uh, we're going we're gonna to dive into learning more about your unique communities, and our intention with this event is to showcase the diversity of this movement and the different uh, forms that people come up with when they come together with the goal to create something that's different than the mainstream, something that is a place of its own in deep connection with people and the local environment. So with that said, we're gonna go to California where Anne is located. And Anne is gonna share about Washington Commons co-housing. I'm so glad to be here. What a wonderful introduction and what an interesting group of communities today. So I'm going to tell you about Washington Commons. We're close to breaking ground in West Sacramento. We will have 35 units condominium ownership. So let's get started. This is a, a quick shot of our place. And I should give credit to Fran, Fran of our, one of our members who put this together. And so I'm basically building on what she put together. I'm the founding member, and so she gave be an ice cream cone here. This is our property. It's just a half an acre. It's in the older part of West Sacramento that is now in a renaissance. But what a location we have. We're urban, but we're also a quiet neighborhood just across the river from a metropolitan area and so many things that are within walking distance. Walking is key to sustainability, and our location is great for that. Here's a picture of, of one of our key um, consultants, Katie McCammon, and our team, which is Urban Development Partners out of Portland. We have wonderful architects. We have a consultant that helps us with marketing and sales. We call it sales. We also have two new consultants, Karen Gimnet, that is working with us on communication. And we have Stacy Walton, who calls herself the diversity doctor because this is an important value for us. We took a good look at PDX Commons in Portland, very similar site in an urban area. And they, I think it's 27 units. One of the differences, they're a senior community, 55 and up. We are all ages. Here is uh, one of our early planning sessions where we're looking, working with our architect to see how the spaces will fall. And then we look at what, trying to prioritize what we want in terms of our common areas another prioritization. Here we are celebrating the end of the workshops. We we're so excited by what we have over four weekends work to create with our architects. The final design, these we have, as I said, 35 condominium units. This is South Exposure and the white areas are common space. South exposure is terrific because it gives us sun. And in West Sacramento, we take advantage of the Delta breeze, which is important when we get warm in Sacramento. We have an interior courtyard. All of the units 
open up onto the courtyard. So when we go home, we'll be able to see from the lights in the window who is there and who we might want to have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine with or get together for dinner. We invited the community in to share what we were planning. Here again is Katie and Zorn, our, our development consultant. We got our application into the city. You can see it's very extensive and we're now waiting for our building permit. We are diverse. We have many spiritual traditions, including atheism and agnostic. And we have uh, people from other countries and uh, many ages. A view near our property, some of the neighborhood shops. The coffee, the Treehouse Cafe is a wonderful place right on the corner uh, next to our property. The Broderick boat ramp, if you have a boat, which I don't, but you can take it in here. We are supportive of all the things going on in our community, including this wonderful organization, Three Sisters Gardens. It's a nonprofit that teaches young people how to grow food and also how to grow themselves. And they grow food and give it to not the low income community and also sell it to the public. One of our nearby restaurants. We're also close to the River Cats, which is a team that the Giants sponsor. We're going to be close to the California Indian Heritage Center, which will be on the river about a mile north from us. Two of our stews out for a bike, and they're standing next to what has become an iconic sculpture in West Sacramento. Here's another iconic building, which houses a brewery as well as a pizza and has all kinds of music and outdoor events. The Tower Bridge takes us across to the city of West Sacramento, to the Crocker Museum, just you know, within walking distance. I should say, one of our members decided to join because they could walk to the Crocker. And you'll be able to walk to the Golden One Center. And what I love is you'll be able to walk, although it is like a mile, maybe a mile and a half, to Amtrak and go anywhere in the country, Chicago, San Francisco, et cetera. How do you join? You start as an explorer for three months. We'll give you a handbook and um, we give you a handbook. When you join as an explorer, you'll be able to come to all of our meetings, including our monthly business meeting, our team meetings. You'll be able to make connections with other members. It's $100. So thank you. I'm Ann Garrity. My email is abgwalks at gmail.com. Take a screenshot, Washington slash Washington dash commons.org and we'll see you soon. I would just add that sometimes people ask about how long it's gonna take. And we expect once we break ground, which we hope to break ground by the end of the year, it will take about a year, about 14 to 17 months. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Um, let's see, um, there are some questions in the chat box. Um, about the um, cost of the units? Yes, that's always a critical question. And our units start at 499 and go up all the way to 790 or 770. And these are estimated prices. We were sad that we had to raise our estimated prices because of the significant increase in construction materials. We are hopeful that they might come down a little bit. And I would just add that because of this, we, we actually have lost one or two members, but several of our members have chosen smaller units because they felt it's so important to be part of our community. 
Mm -hmm. Nice. And is there an option to be an explorer virtually? If definitely, we're basically because of COVID, all virtually, all virtual now, and all of our meetings are on uh, on Zoom, and uh, including what we do for explorers is we give them a personal orientation, and when they're ready to uh, move toward membership, we give them a, a personal financial orientation as well. Okay, okay, nice. And um, you've mentioned it a little bit, some of the ways your community has been affected by COVID with the building materials. Are there other ways that you have been affected by the COVID pandemic? Well, of course, we are all, all by Zoom now. You know, we used to have potlucks for our business meetings with people from far away coming in by Zoom. And now it's, it's all Zoom. The benefit of that is that we're, we've learned how to use Zoom. We use the, you know, we break into groups. And so we're taking advantage of that communication tool. I should say the other thing is, I think all of us, and I'm sure this is true for other panelists and people online, we now know how important community is. And I think that has been valuable to us and um, learn, uh, you know, out of challenges have grown closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we've noticed that at FIC, how there is a um, really an awakening happening around the value of community. And right. people are waking up to, oh, wow, this is very important. I can't just get along so easily living on my own or even living with my nuclear family. So, right. great. Oh, I see. See, Mary, you want to try again? I'll allow you to talk. And there, can you try? Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Um, this is, I've noticed a trend kind of with um, these communities. This, this one sounds like amazing, but for people like me who don't have, you know, $500,000 laying around and don't have access to it, I see these as gated communities, only they're more selective about who they let in. And that kind of bothers me because community is great. I understand that, but I can go to an old folks home and have a community. Not much fun, but um, it's just the price is prohibitive for a lot of us. So I guess what we just keep looking well, Mary, I have a question for you. What price would work for you? I live in Idaho, and so I'm poor as dirt. There's nothing. <laughs> oh, I'm not kidding. This state has the second lowest median income in the U.S. We've just been gentrified, so we have million-dollar homes going up, and people are, are basically fleeing the state because they can't live here anymore. Um, the only price that would work for me is about Oh, 80,000, you know, I mean, I, uh, maybe a hundred, but I don't have the kind of money that a lot of, and it's not just your community. I noticed other communities were like 700,000 for a 700 square foot uh, condo. It's like, oh dear. So. Mary, I, I, I'm very troubled and have been troubled by what you talk about about because I agree with you and what I've been so I've been really studying the affordable housing and all those mm -hmm. things I'd be I'd be glad to talk to you on offline some of my ideas because I I do have some ideas about this but what okay. I would say is that in California and this is probably true elsewhere construction costs are what they are mm -hmm. and the affordable housing construction is is almost as expensive as our um, housing, but it's subsidized. But I do have some ideas, and I'd love to talk to you. So send me a note, abgwalks at gmail.com, and let's connect, and I'll give you some of my ideas. Okay, I would love to hear that. Thank you so much. Mm, yes. Thank you so much, Mary, for bringing that forward. Really appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. 
So we'll do one more question. I see Angela and Michael, and I know you do. Hello, welcome. What's your question? Hi, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, great. Hi, thank you all. Um, Michael here, Angela's here too. Um, I just, and that's really great. Um, we live in um, Sonoma County, so not that far um, in California. Um, I'm curious, one of the things when I look at co-housing communities, um, I'm curious if there's anything more built into your co-housing that makes it co more community than just co-housing. You know what I mean? There, You can have just co-housing. I know some that people live there and then they sort of like live their own little lives and they're little, still in their own little cubicle. And uh, it doesn't even have a community feel sometimes. So I'm just kind of curious if there's more steps that have been taken in, in your case to yeah. Well, you know, thank you for that question, Michael. I think every community is a little different. One yeah. of the things Katie says is that community meals are the secret sauce of co-housing because and most co-housing, but not all, have community meals. I expect we'll have two to four community meals a week, and that'll be a time for informal gathering, and then there'll be lots of other opportunities. I will say that I, um, as a founding member, had a, had a, um, you know, it was, I was able to select the place I wanted to be, which was an urban co-housing. And I've been involved in uh, civic work, including pedestrian advocacy. So it was important for me to be in a place where we could be a part of the community as well as create our own community. So I see um, a very vibrant community. We even have one member who is a deacon in her church. And so I think, you know, there's gonna be all kinds of interesting things. We're now, we're now working on diversity and creating uh, ways to interact with the community in that regard as well. It's but I look question. forward, Angela and Michael, I look forward to talking to you more directly. Send me an email and we'll talk. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Okay, great. Thank you, Angela and Michael. And I think that's about all the time we have for questions for Anne. I see there are some more in the chat and the Q&A box. So Anne, feel free to respond to people there uh, via, via typing. And uh, thank you again so much for sharing about your community. Yeah, really appreciate it. All right, so now from California, we're gonna come all the way back here to Vermont. And we're gonna hear from a community that's located very close to where I am right now. And I had the opportunity to visit last week, I think it was. Um, and, I, and I loved the community there that um, Peter has with the Monastic Academy, also called Maple. Um, and, you know, with, with not being able to travel so much right now, I've been making more of an effort just to visit communities that are nearby, uh, even ones that I maybe normally wouldn't visit, but are right in my backyard. And so I encourage all of you to think about, like, what communities are there that I may not know about that are just so close and I could go and help to foster and strengthen this network. So that said, Peter, uh, warm welcome to you. Thanks for taking the time out of your day. I know you all are in a treat retreat over there. So just really appreciate you being here and looking forward to learning about your community. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to present with everybody else. And I love hearing about Anne's community and a lot of the similar challenges and questions coming up for us. I'm part of a community called the Monastic Academy. Uh, we're based in Lowell, Vermont, as Cynthia said, and uh, it's no different than I imagine most intentional communities in that we already have a monastic, in that we already have a monastic container of uh, practitioners together, and now uh, in the future we're working on building a village, so there will be a village community around the monastic core. Uh, so, let's see. so yeah. My name is uh, Peter. I recently got lay ordained, so they gave me the name Shura Mitra, or everyone calls me Mitra, which is uh, Sanskrit for friend. So I go by either Peter or friend. I'm the executive director here at uh, the Monastic Academy, 
as well as one of the teachers and have been here since uh, 2015. It's uh, particularly nice to join everyone here because I actually tried to start an intentional community in Boston uh, before joining here with a group of meditators and over the course of a year learned how hard that is. And one of the reasons I joined this community was to learn how do you actually do this. And so uh, I'm very glad to connect with everyone else here and that we all have that same aspiration. Um, so yeah, we talk a little bit about Maple. Uh, we are located in Vermont, but we have about 125 acres. We're about maybe 30, 40 minutes away from the Northern uh, Canadian border. So we're like very rural, very rustic. Uh, Montreal is about two hours away. Burlington's about an hour and a half away. Uh, and right now there's already 18 full-time residents who live here and train here together. We wake up at 4.30 in the morning to do chanting and we do meditation, we do exercise, we eat meals together, and we run the nonprofit offering different services, online programs, as well as hosting guests. And we also have four apprentices right now and two residential members who are guests that come here and uh, participate in the community, but can also do their own co-working uh, job on their own time, or uh, sometimes people have come and wrote a music album or uh, did remote coaching or other services. So uh, we try to fit in as many different types of people as possible here. Um, and actually the vision of our place is to have many centers. So Maple is here and actually was originally started by this teacher, Sori Fora, which is a you know, gentleman on the left side. He is an uh, ordained Rinzai Zen monk. He trained for about a decade, primarily in Japan, but also in China and India. And he came to the US after training and originally taught a lot of mindfulness in public schools. And uh, originally his first nonprofit that we now evolved to this residential community was to teach mindfulness teachers to teach in public schools. And so we actually originally started in Burlington uh, as a nine month program to teach mindfulness teachers and over time have evolved into this monastic community. We also have budding communities in the Bay Area called Oak and another budding community in Toronto started by a station so meditating there uh, called Willow. Uh, so the genesis of our community is very spiritual and very much tackling uh, what we see as the core problems in the world right now and starting with ourselves noticing the defilements the blocks in ourselves and doing meditation practices community life to work through that as well as creating cultural change and as well as addressing the planetary crisis that um, the way we see it that all of life on the planet is threatened these days by things like nuclear war, or, uh, climate change, and artificial intelligence. And we believe that it's necessary to create communities that can collectively create the uh, cultural change and technologies and role models for a different way forward. And so we're trying our best to realize that, and utterly failing, but trying each day to make it happen. Um, yeah, I already said that. This photo is, uh, we did a Vesak ceremony, which is in Buddhism. Uh, the, it said that the Buddha was born, uh, enlightened and died on the same day. So a lot of Buddhist uh, countries celebrate what they call Vesak. And we had this wonderful ceremony in May where we went around the land and bowed to the earth and uh, said prayers. Um, yeah, so originally the last five years, six years that I've been part of this community, it's primarily been residents come here and train full time, making at least initial year commitment to develop themselves in both their awakening and wisdom and love, as well as empowering themselves to learn practical real world skills of how to lead and start organizations and uh, become a, a ethical actor in the world. Um, and so that's been the core thing we've been doing up till now. 
Uh, we offer different programs, such as our residential program. Uh, we have a 10-week free apprenticeship program, which usually is around four to six people. Uh, we have guests that come for our residential membership. Uh, we have monthly retreats. We've been creating more online classes due to COVID, and now we have a village. Um, these are some of the retreats we've been offering. So unlike, say, a traditional monastery, we do a lot of different things. Uh, there's about nine residents actually right now in the forest doing the vision quest. And I just did a sweat lodge last night, so I'm actually kind of very tired and you know dehydrated, so sorry if I'm not fully 100% here. Yeah, so we're trying to create a village now. So we have about 10 plots we're trying to uh, uh, offer. And the first plot is, we actually have about two or three plots already sold, and right now we're working on infrastructure. Um, and the aspiration is that anyone that feels called to live in spiritual community, but doesn't necessarily want to live the monastic life of waking up at 4.30 and uh, training 24 seven, but might actually want to do other work or raise a child or have retired. Uh, this is the community where uh, you want to increase the optionality so that different folks can come here. Uh, in addition, we're looking at some spelling stuff there to create an impact hub in the village that will, a few select people will be working on the new technologies that are being created, such as current cryptocurrency or artificial intelligence to try to scale what we do here onto a global uh, space. Um, really, the way we see things is that monasteries have kind of solved the problem of human greed and ignorance on an individual or a very small communal level but it's very hard to scale that to an entire civilization and arguably that's never happened before. And so uh, at Maple, we're trying to not just train the few residents that are here, but we wanna uh, practice in that way so that we can create the systems change necessary so that everyone is, is incentivized to live an ethical, uh, peaceful, loving life uh, rather than what happens now, where if you wanna be peaceful, ethical, it's your uh, the capitalism and the systems that will kind of disincentivize you from doing that. Uh, so these are our two first villagers. That is Renee and that is Rich D. Uh, they were here for our February retreat and they're actually the parents of one of our former residents, uh, Joshin. And they were initially very skeptical about meditation and mindfulness and community and they tried to convince Joshin to stop doing this. You should live a normal life and you know, make a lot of money and get kids and everything. And they visited and over time, they uh, realized the great value of living in community of doing personal development work and uh, have already committed themselves. They're building their house right now to uh, hopefully move in this winter. And so we're very excited to have them here and we also have another couple, Ananda and Maitri, who uh, have both done apprenticeships programs here and have committed to uh, living here. And we're actually all going to their wedding next uh, in October. And then they're hoping to build their house here soon there afterwards. So very excited that we have a few villagers locked in. Uh, here's a photo of some of our centers. So in this top left and top right, we spent a good portion of the summer, sadly having to clear the trees for the village. And so we did a lot of ceremony to honor the earth and grieve that uh, we had to cut these trees down and had a burn pile to cut them down. Uh, these two photos of people sitting is our meditation hall or Zendo, where we do a lot of our programs and sits. And we're also building right now this photos from last week, a uh, second meditation hall. So we have a lot of active development happening right now. Uh, some quick details. Right now, the current financial model is there's a $100,000 one-time plot payment to lease the land for 49 years. And then the owner is uh, responsible for building the house themselves and whatever cost that is. Uh, there's a monthly communal fee cover basic expenses and utilities. And with that, they have access to all of our offerings, including the daily sitting, 
meals with us, workshops, uh, retreats, and everything else. Since we are in very rural Vermont, so ostensibly if they're coming here, they want to participate in the training and community here. Uh, here's some more photos. Uh, last year, we fortunately got a grant from a nonprofit to start doing solar panels, and we've been working very much in trying to be more off-grid and uh, resilient in as we see weather patterns are changing rapidly, we want to make sure uh, we're not too vulnerable. And uh, yeah, so fortunately, we have a very vibrant community already here. And now we want to kind of expand our options so that more people can be a part of this and that we can grow what we created here, both geographically to create more centers, but also to invite more uh, types of folks that can be here and uh, help us change the world together. And, make it so that we can live a more peaceful life. Um, so there's my email at the top and uh, here's some quotes from uh, recent guests and participants. And I think that's everything for me. Thank you um, again for sharing about the Monastic Academy. And I'll just add one of the things I was um, very intrigued by was this interesting culture you have there of quite serious monastic study and tradition coupled with, you know, people sitting around on their computers and plugged into the tech world and coming from maybe IT and business backgrounds. So it's just a very, and a lot of young people, it was such an mm -hmm. interesting melding of, of these different cultures. So um, yeah, I'm fascinated by your work there. And I hope that building the village is uh, successful. It sounds like it will be. You have a great foundation for it. Thank you. Yeah, great. Any questions for Peter? Um, let's see. Um, uh, we have some questions. You had mentioned a monthly community community fee. Um, how much is that, if you don't mind? All right. So right now it's six hundred dollars a month, um, and that includes things like trash and recycling and road maintenance and access to all of our facilities. Um, it's possible that our um, you might change some of the fees in the future, um, but right now that's that's what it's saying. Okay. Okay. Great. Let's see. Um, yep. And wonderful, you put the the website link right there. Any other questions for Peter? Yeah. Okay. See some folks have their hands up. So let's go to Carol. Hi all, greetings. Um, great that you're doing this, really wonderful. Peter, I'm just, I'm very curious, is there in a meditation uh, culture, is there room for play and singing and folk dancing and uh, in, in those kind of creative modalities? Does that happen also in your community as a way of, expressing joy and pleasure. Right. Well, as Cynthia said, it's very confusing and uh, complex. Uh, so we definitely, I, I have a video of us all dancing and singing and chanting together. Um, and it's strange that I think we do a lot of different things and sometimes we're very serious and very still. And that's, that's what we're trying to do is to find that peace inside ourselves that doesn't uh, require any external conditional um, support. Um, but other times we do dance and sing and cook delicious meals. And um, I think as we develop the village, that actual, the range of what's possible will actually expand. So there'll be a few people that might spend uh, three months or six months or a year just only is dedicated towards practice and primarily being by themselves. But then we might have villagers and other residents that are uh, maybe running the school and having children playing and teaching them how to play music and how to cook and how to take care of the forest. Um, and so a lot of what we create is in response to what's needed and what's asked for. And so uh, it's it's a very big mix and creative tension of how do we hold um, all of this together that we don't want to uh, 
lose anything vital, but there's only so much difference we can hold before you just become you know, a blob of nothing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. Thank you. I just, I was just curious. I so value um, what you're doing and yeah. I come from traditions of folk singing and folk dancing, Pete Seeger and other traditions that are about promoting peace and cultivating um, awareness on those cultural levels. So I, uh, you know, the balance of both just seems yeah. wonderful. I would also just say that, um, so Maple is based in Vermont and the other communities, um, we are sort of in both collaboration and competition that there is some level of oversight, but we also want to differentiate each center to its strengths and local needs. So for example, the Canadian branch focuses much more on interpersonal relating and trauma healing and creativity. Um, uh, whereas in Vermont, our teacher Soryu spends the majority of his time here. So we can actually practice more awakening and deep intensive meditations because yeah. he's here. And the California branch does a lot more uh, singing and dancing and uh, <laughs> networking because they're right in the Bay Area. Got so, it. So um, there would also be that geographical difference between the centers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great question, Carol. Thank you. And uh, let's see. So just taking a look here, there's, there's a bunch of questions. Um, one question we have from the Q&A box, and then we'll take the other hand that's up. Um, is Maple strictly in Buddhist tradition? If so, a particular school of Buddhism? Are you trying to teach non-secretarian individuals to teach them the healing mindfulness? Hmm, right. Well, as Cynthia said, we have predominantly young people here, although it hasn't always been that case. Mostly people in their 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and uh, most of the people who come here are people that are somewhat allergic to organized religion or existing offerings and so we get a lot of the uh, sort of misfits that don't that want deep spirituality but don't see anything that uh, speaks to them um, and so this place Maple I would say we definitely utilize monastic training and primarily Buddhist teachings. However, um, there's a very lovely Sufi teacher who comes here every once in a while. And there's also nine residents right now in the forest doing the vision quest with the guide of one of our friends from Colorado. So I would say we're primarily a mystical school, but our strengths and background is primarily in Buddhism. So we utilize what we know and what we know works. Um, and one of our godfathers, of our tradition, you could say, is this teacher named Shinzen Yang, who uh, teaches a secretarian version of uh, a secular version of uh, meditation and mindfulness that's very uh, science based, actually. And so um, we don't really care if a person's agnostic or atheist or Christian, or Buddhist, or whatever, but we do care that people are developing their capacity for uh, virtue and uh, love and compassion. So, uh, and so uh, I would say this center uses a lot of Buddhist uh, teachings, but it's very possible that another center, if there was a qualified teacher in the community, could be a Sufi center or a Christian mystical center or a, a super modern rationalist center or something. Uh, again, assuming that it's qualified, that there's a qualified teacher in the in this sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And that, that was clarifying for me too. I wasn't sure of that myself. All right. And let's go to Angela, Angela and Michael and be one of the last questions. Go ahead. Hi there. This is Angela. Um, thank you so much, Peter. I really enjoyed hearing all of what you shared. I have a great interest um, both the deep spirituality and the interpersonal development um, aspects, plus, you know, the rural living and um, <clears throat> being prepared for climate change. There's just all the levels that you're working with. I really appreciate that. And I have some questions about um, 
the personal development aspect, um, you mentioned the Canadian branch is more maybe focused on that. And I was wondering um, if you might speak to some of the um, structures that you guys use uh, to do that. It sounds like you're also open to, you know, different kinds of workshops. Would you be open to people living there, you know, offering workshops uh, both to the community and to the larger uh, you know, society. Um, and then I also have questions about, uh, like the indigenous, uh, practices I've done, you know, years and years of, um, native practices and mm -hmm. different kinds of ritual. And I'm quite curious about, um, how that is, um, uh, being held and, um, are there teachers or, you know, how is that and then last question, if there's time about how close the buildings are to one another and possibly is there a main kitchen and um, how close, you know, is everything? <clears throat> right. Thank you. Um, the interpersonal, the uh, native or indigenous um, uh, traditions uh, where they're coming from and then the location. Right, 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 right. Um, let's write this down. Yeah, so I can start with the easiest one, which is location. And we very much want everything to be within walking distance, ideally. So within five or 10 minutes, ideally everyone can get to everything. And so that uh, no one's need to drive to get to where they want to go in, within the community. And so um, I can get from my bedroom to the Zendo or the main hall where we eat food. Uh, within less than you know, within a minute or two, and then the D's house is about maybe five, six minutes away, and so it's under construction right now. But um, ideally, we want all the houses to be within walking distance, and uh, not make it so that like, cars not even necessary. Um, you don't. We currently have the monastic kitchen that feeds everyone, and, uh, but or our our aspiration is maybe in the next year or two to build a separate uh, structure in the village that will have maybe five or six very small apartments. And then the first floor would just be a working space and communal kitchen and dining area, um, as well as maybe like an exercise area or a yoga studio. Um, but we're, we're at the very preliminary stages of just talking to architects about designing that right now and doing fundraising to to build that. Um, in terms of native ceremonies, um, I mentioned very briefly, there's this wonderful guy, Darren Silver, who uh, has spent many years uh, living on reservations and also doing tracking school, who comes out here each year and leads a week long vision quest. And this year is the first time he's doing two quests. So we're very grateful for him uh, for doing that. And last night I participated in a sweat lodge with him. Uh, very very tired today but um and so uh darren himself although he learned a great deal from uh different uh tribes um he's also trying to respond to the needs that are coming to him and similar to us at maple um he's kind of creating a unique uh hybrid approach where he wants to definitely honor where these practices come from while also not representing uh at he, he's not an indigenous he's not uh a native person himself so he, he doesn't feel comfortable representing that and he's trying to create his own uh form of practice that honors and acknowledges but is also distinct from uh those yeah. ceremonies mm -hmm. and also soryu is good friends of darren soryu is the head teacher here and uh he also spent a few years um off and on practicing different native ceremonies, going to some dance, doing lodges. Um, and so there is a certain element of native uh, influence here, but it's not necessarily, a, I wouldn't say it's a primary or um, very large part of what we do, but we definitely would love it to be more. And recently we had an Abernathy elder come and spend a day with us and help us uh, be tracking the rewards. And so um, 
definitely very open to that. But in terms of just qualified features and um, it's very challenging. Yeah. Um, and similar answer to the workshops and different practices is that um, the Canadian branch, for example, is doing an experimental three month new trial period where they're trying out uh, this intensive training program where they do things like focusing, uh, embodiment, uh, IFS, uh, meditation, uh, different energy body practices, and uh, a, a lot of circling interpersonal meditation relating practices, authentic relating, and, um, and trying to see, does that create a better community and also bring people that could then, if they wanted to really pursue a deep intensive uh, meditation practice. Um, so we've only been around for, you know, about 10 years total, if we count the early days where we weren't even a monastery or monastic institution. So we're very much experimental. Um, but in terms of where our strong suits are, it's Soryuz has very deep training in traditional monasticism, but we're also trying to experiment and see what is a modern monastery look like for the 21st century needs and uh, population. Mm, such a wonderful answer. Thank you so very much. This meets so many of my needs. Yeah, well, I hope I hope you come visit. Yeah. yeah, we would just be delighted. Mm, Thank you. That's exciting. Thank you for those questions. And I think that's about all the time we have for you, Peter. And there are a lot more questions that people have put into the Q&A box. Do you see that? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can respond to those too. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's, there's some good ones in there. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. I really appreciate them all. Okay. Well, last but certainly not least, we have Zarina. So we're going back to California. Yes, that's where you're located. Yes, and I'm so curious. I've, I've been like working with you a little bit and I don't really know the full story about, about where you live and what you all are up to. So I'm just gonna hand it over to you, Lovely. take it away. Lovely. Um, okay, well, I'm just gonna um, uh, sort of go through a few slides and just, I wanna create a picture, but I've got a video for you, a video tour of the, of the, the communes uh, that uh, will be in the second half. Uh, so welcome to Hate Street Commons. We are do-it-yourself communal housing. <clears throat> uh, we are a federation of self-determined intentional communities in the Bay Area on a lonely land. Um, and really, uh, because these communities are self-determined, they're all very different, and we're all experimenting with various forms of home, culture, and comments. Um, so, you know, one of the sort of main things that we focus on is generating different kinds of surplus through being in a, in a communal house, through being in a commons, uh, and experimenting with what we can do with that surplus. And so living together generates a ton of different kinds of surplus. It's often quite sort of financially efficient. Uh, it often produces a lot of surplus time because you're, you know, collectively buying food together and collectively doing your, your sort of like uh, domesticity together. And often there's a surplus of space also because you're in these big spaces, big houses, there's lots of common areas, which allows lots of people to sort of host events and sort of do cultural commoning. So um, if the commons is the kind of uh, the things we hold in common and the life we generate together, uh, commoning as a verb is really leaning into the sort of social relationships um, that allow us to sort of take care of and steward what we produce in common together. So a couple of the things we're really interested in is prefigurative politics and transfer cultures. So this is the sort of social elements, the governance, the decision making, the care, the kinship um, uh, that is needed to sort of get us from the, the current formation of society into maybe the one that we are seeking or the one that we hope for. Uh, and for many of us, I think we see that home has really been a site of like the production of society. And it's really a place to experiment with new ways uh, and perhaps old ways of being. Uh, so some of our goals are to sort of to experiment and explore a sort of parallel economy based on the commons. Uh, so that's the real sharing economy, uh, real kinship. Uh, to leverage our surplus for sort of social good and, and uh, to sort of help support the, the, the broader environment in which we live. And of course, to support each other and to support the generation, curation uh, of other spaces and new spaces. 
So lots of projects have come out of these communal houses. We have the, research, the communes research commune, uh, which does uh, collects the documentation from all the different houses, the shared values, the vision documents, uh, the learnings, and sort of puts it in one place so that when you start new houses, you can come and peruse these uh, sort of um, <clears throat> uh, other kinds of documents and take some inspiration from, from what's been done before. Uh, we have a guidebook for setting up an intentional community house, which has been sort of crowdsourced by everybody. Um, we have lots of people sort of working on sort of documenting the ways uh, that we live. Uh, so this is a wonderful uh, diagram created by Eric Rogers uh, that, that sort of uh, points to the scales of sharing that happens in communal living, the types of communal relations, the types of communications and the platforms on which those might take place, the various governance systems that operate in different houses um, uh, and various forms of conflict resolution. Uh, we've been collaborating with uh, architecture departments to sort of map some of the ways in which these houses share. Uh, so this is a sort of diagram that shows the locations of some of our buildings uh, and, the, and the lines and the kinds of lines sort of depict the type of sharing uh, that goes on, whether it's financial, whether there's a tool sharing library, whether people are sharing cars and bikes and so on and so forth. We also have a wonderful newsletter that uh, sometimes is digital, sometimes is paper. This is sort of um, a beautiful uh, sort of surrealist newsletter that was delivered in hand to all the, the, the communes. And we pre in the before times, pre-COVID had a ton of events. And so cultural commons was a huge part um, of what we did. We had salons, public discussions, uh, lectures. Um, lots of support circles, so emotional solidarities is a big part of what takes place. Uh, so we have a ton of different support circles for various different people's needs, uh, which allows people to sort of learn and distribute the skills that come with um, uh, emotional well-being. Just some images from all the different houses to try and give you a sort of sense of the vibe. There's a lot of like uh, creative expression um, going on in these houses. Okay, so this is the video. This was made by Anna, who lives in one of our communes. This is from 2008, so it's a little bit out of date, but it really <clears throat> depicts sort of uh, some of the characters and the vibe. Let me know if you can't hear. My name is Jamin, and I live in Chateau Ubuntu. I have about 30 housemates. My name is Roxanne. I live in the convent. I have 24 housemates. My name is Sabine. I live in Manzanita. I live with 10 other people. There's definitely been a surge in interest in communal living in the Bay Area right now. There are about 300 co-living spaces. Uh, that's about the same amount that there were in the Bay Area in the 60s. I'm Eric Rogers. I live here at the Red Victorian and I'm really interested in communes, not just from a personal standpoint. I'm currently in the process of uh, writing a thesis about communal living and what it means to live communally in the 21st century. So for me, communal living is first and foremost a group of people sharing a set of common resources, usually in a domestic setting. We are on Haight Street in the Haight-Ashbury. We took it over a few years ago as a peace hotel from the 70s. So the Red Victorian is a really unique and cool building. Starting from when you enter, there is a giant double wide storefront that is basically our communal living room. So then there are 21 bedrooms upstairs on the second and third floor, including a giant uh, upstairs living room with a sort of like lofted hangout space. And, and then we have a really beautiful roof and we run a small hotel and bed and breakfast out of the space as well. And then we also have a few little like secret nooks scattered throughout the house. The house is a winding labyrinth of colorful light and uh, weird little garden spaces and stuff. And so we have these long winding hallways between our bedrooms. Having folks around to um, hang out with, spend time with, be close with, be intimate with uh, is a really huge part of it for me. But I also see there being like economic benefits. Like I cook once a month and I am cooked for the other 29 days out of the month. I have this huge building at my disposal. Basically, I have like the biggest house out of anyone I know. My name's Zarina. I'm from London and I've been in San Francisco for four years. And I luckily collided with the people who started the embassy right at the beginning. 
So the Embassy Network is an international network of houses and really our close relationship is, is between the Embassy and the Red Victorian. But this sort of overlaps in the Venn diagram with H Street Commons, which is our little group of communes of Hate Street, of which I think there are now 11, two new ones have sprung up in the last week. And you know, it's 250, 300 people of intentional communities and communes that are united through geography. There's a long history of this, you know, the, the communes are an old phenomenon but I do think that the first step in us leveraging our power of being together is knowing that we exist, accepting that whilst we may be on the periphery of society, peripheries generally have a large surface area and if we all stood up together we'd probably have some really powerful weight. So the narrative is very much around how San Francisco is over and tech has ruined the city, but actually there's this really rich counterculture all over the place where people are providing mutual aid and shared learnings and doing all sorts of interesting things and this isn't really seen. There are now fairly regular events called Hate Free Love which are these little post-capitalist outposts on Hate Street where money doesn't count for anything and people try and use sort of like behavioural and experiential art to show people that you could live a different way. Do we think that atomized living is the default Thing for everyone that seems unlikely I'm not suggesting that this way of living is the right way for everyone but this way of living is experimenting with what works for you most people probably lack social contact and social intimacy in various forms and living in this manner you you have so many of those needs met the communes have to be what they are for the people living in them and I'm certainly not going to dictate what they should and shouldn't be but what I hope they can be for at least some people are sites of experimentation with different ways of behaving, different norms, different ways of making decisions and of governance so that we can start to kind of experiment with the kind of society we would like to have. It's really interesting to think about what we can bring to the folks who don't actually live with us. We have a huge culture here of not having our commons only benefit ourselves. Usually we have large common areas and what we've been doing at the Red Vic in the embassy is having salons and lectures as well as connecting people who might not uh, otherwise meet each other. I think a really interesting model for us is to look at churches and the fact that church attendance is down and incidentally having to get rid of their buildings which actually might make really good communes. Uh, but the thing is, like, the role that church has played in people's lives is not just like religious indoctrination or whatever. It also has served as like a center of community, a place where you go to like discuss your morals and values and ethics and so forth. Places where you actually like meet people and get to know your neighbors. I think if communal living has a robust future, we actually need to figure out legislation and financial structures for supporting it. Crucial elements of any mass-produced version of domesticity. We get inspected a lot and often the city doesn't know like what we're doing or who we are like it just doesn't make sense in their boxes or categories of types of institutions and we're kind of an institution and we're kind of a household and they just don't understand they're like either you're a business or you're a family what are you like for me i'm really interested in redefining what family means it turns out that we lived like this for a very long time <laughs> we being much of humanity in its long history I, I see it as like actually the, the way I want to live my life moving forward. Yeah, there are a lot of people who use like shoppers. <laughs>
focus on the needs of, of that less represented group. And it's been so wonderful. These two houses are very popular and uh, really great sites of um, community and, and also shift the sort of cultural narrative about what it's like to be a returning citizen and what, what, uh, what the experience of those people is. Uh, we've recently set up a house called the Tree House, which is a intentional intergenerational intentional community centered around the needs of foster care youth. And so we're starting to see the communes try and actively work to sort of oppose the segregation that's really present in society. I don't think we've solved the affordable housing issue that uh, that Mary brought up, but um, I definitely think we need to. Ways to plug in. So our sort of um, thesis is that density breeds collaboration. We'd like lo love to encourage people to come and stay. If you're ever in the Bay Area, reach out. Uh, lots of the houses have sort of like informal guest programs. And I honestly think it's, it's so much better than sharing Google Docs. Um, you know, I'd love to see us almost do a sort of community rotation where people could go and visit, you know, all, all these different sort of community projects. Um, and uh, of course, for, for us, joining is a side effect of doing. So actually, there's no barrier to joining H Street Commons. All you have to do, all the house has to do is say, hey, we want to we want to join <laughs> and, um, and collaborate. And that's really it. So please do reach out. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Serena. Wow. I I had no idea. I had heard <laughs> of the Embassy Collective and I knew like all the communities in the Bay, but I had no idea there were so many and how many mm -hmm. people are involved. It's incredible. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I feel very lucky to be in this federation. It is really wonderful. Um, there is a unique kind of sharing that can happen when you have cross house sharing that is quite difficult to do just inside your house. So I feel very lucky. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for the work you're doing and for sharing. And um, I'm almost thinking, oh, we need to have you and more of your people here and do like a full uh, presentation also on what you've been researching regarding communes and different structures within that. Um, mm -hmm. That actually is a good segue. The first question we got in the Q&A box is a question I also have. Um, are the documents about community structures available for people outside of your communities to access? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I'll make them available. Um, <clears throat> I'll share the website, which has got all our blog posts on and the sort of handbook. Uh, and if you're missing anything or have any specific questions, please just email us and um, we'd love to support, you know, I feel like your presentation was very rich and also just like I'm still putting <laughs> it all in and you gave a lot of information too. Yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a, you know, like um, something I didn't touch on is the sort of projects that have emerged from these cross house collaborations. So we have, you know, all sorts of conflict resolution systems that have emerged. Um, we have a project called the Alternative Justices Project, which is about sort of transformative justice and dealing with violent um, violence prevention in our community houses because home is a huge site of violence and um, and so there's a lot of like social um, projects that have sort of like emerged from from these that I didn't get a chance to, to touch on. Yeah, yeah, great. I can only imagine <laughs> when you have so many people together, so much creativity is possible. Okay, Torben, I see your hand up, so go ahead. So yeah, I guess I just had logistical questions about the cost to live at some of these communities <laughs> and the service requirements of living in them. And I guess in general, what the turnover is of people who, who, who mm -hmm. live there because yeah. rent prices are ridiculous. And um, I would imagine that this, this kind of community might draw a lot of interest from people who aren't specifically interested in intentional communities. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, you know, going back to Mary's earlier point, it is a huge source of tension. Um, so rent prices in this area are extraordinary. Um, and of course, we're subject to the rent of our landlords. Uh, and so we have to sort of be creative about how to make sure that these spaces are accessible. And I, I don't think we've succeeded. Different houses do different things. Something I've seen happen um, often is um, um, subsidized spaces so that the collective will get together and make sure that there is a subsidized space, um, sometimes even a free room uh, for certain people. Um, uh, the other thing I've seen is that many houses will try and create 
um, use their largest room to be a shared room so that there's always spaces for someone who can only pay, you know, six hundred, seven hundred dollars a month. And you can't. It's very difficult to find anywhere in this uh, in this city to 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 live in for six, seven hundred dollars a month. And uh, and so we sort of, you know, these aren't like um, shoddy bunk dorms. These are like really lovely rooms that are like really carefully curated to make them feel nice. And that, uh, that makes sure that there's some accessibility, um, but um, rent prices are really terrible. That's true. Uh, and then what was the other question? Turnover. Turnover is really different. So uh, it's very different for different houses. And that's actually been a wonderful thing. So the house that I live in, we've been here for coming up 10 years and I've been here for the whole time. Um, and I think about sort of a third of us have been here for the whole time. And then there's been sort of many generations since, but people tend to stay for multiple years here. Uh, on the other hand, there are houses like Chateau Ubuntu that you saw in the video, which unfortunately um, uh, closed this year um had very high turnover but actually it was a wonderful sort of communal institution because um people would sort of move into ubuntu form their friendships and then sort of bud off and start a new house and so many new houses were sort of birthed out of chateau ubuntu and so um i think it's it's very different across different houses and that's a wonderful thing great great questions thank you oh thank you and um yeah, I'd be interested in coming in, coming by and seeing some across the bay. Um, Do. But sweet, yeah. Uh, I'd love it if you'd share your info. Um, yes, I think I put it in uh, in the chat, but I'll put my personal email in here as well. Um, and yeah, I guess the last question I had was about service. Um, what are the what service requirements? Service? Um, service requirements? Booking, uh, cleaning responsibilities, any responsibilities that I guess yeah. aren't normal for living in an apartment building? Yeah, I think, again, these change. So some houses are, you know, have the idea. I've seen, you know, for example, I've seen houses that are like, we've come together to work on social stuff. We don't want to like spend a lot of time taking care of the trash and they'll often, you know, like collectively outsource some of that work. I've seen other houses that are like, no, we want to, to collectively make sure that we don't have, you know, that we minimize negative externalities in the world and that we're actually able to take care of our our own domesticity and so it's quite different for different houses uh, where I live we have no people we have no sort of um, chore wheel uh, we um, people sort of volunteer to take on the, the things that they find um, easy to do and in that way actually the house runs pretty well um, but we don't have sort of assigned roles or assigned tasks um, people just sort of step up to do what they're energized by um, and that has has worked pretty well for us Okay, great. Great, thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we have a question here about if you have um, families living in the communes or is it mostly individuals? Uh, we do have families. It's, you know, it's, it's, it has been a bit hard. You know, often the community houses don't build for the diversity of humans. Uh, you know, so actually I think where we're really worst at this is uh, for the um, access, like disabled community and accessibility issues. The houses in the Bay are just appalling. Uh, they just cannot meet the needs um, of our, for our disabled community. Uh, families, I think, are less affected, but definitely it's harder. We have got some families. We had uh, people with children living at the Red Victorian. Uh, we've had people with babies living uh, here at the embassy. So there's a smattering of families. But as I said, now we have uh, the tree house, um, uh, which is a, a place specifically built for people who want to live in intergenerational ways. Uh, and we're starting to see other houses take suit. So I think we've got two or three other houses that will probably start this year specifically centered around um, family living. Uh, and those are a combination of bio families, you know, uh, genetic families and chosen sort of uh, families, so adoptive uh, and foster foster care. Mm, great, great. Okay, well, let me see what other questions. Um, a lot of people are saying, oh, I want to visit. Oh, I had no idea. So please do, um, you know, check out the, the website and um, get in touch with Serena directly. Um, let me see. How are people accepted or vetted into the different buildings? 
Yeah, so um, that's a great question, and I have always held this tension, which is, you know, people houses get a sort of um, a vibe, you know, like, oh, this place is an art place, and oh, this place is a sort of intellectual ph philosophical place. And what happens is people will sort of like um, cluster around those vibes, and um, that sort of does lead to a little bit of segregation. And often the houses want to have more variety in their humans, but the humans want to go to houses that sort of match their needs. And so there's a sort of funny tension in the, in the community matchmaking. I'm sure you've um, seen this, Cynthia. Um, so what we've done, so the houses sort of all have their own um, application forms and, and ways of, uh, of getting to know their, their new residents. But we also have a, a sort of, we call it the, the, the sorting hat, uh, a centralized application. So you can apply on the website um, and that gets sent to our Slack. Uh, and all the houses can peruse those applications so people can sort of uh, go in and, and see who's applied. Uh, and then if you apply, you also get sent the list of all the openings that are present um, at the moment. So I think, you know, community matchmaking is really a, a thing to solve because this isn't housing, right? And so um, there isn't a cookie cutter application form and then, oh, you've got money in your bank, great, you're accepted. This is very much about choosing your chosen family, which sort of actually is in tension with often housing law. Um, uh, and so uh, often it's a process of getting to know people um, because there's a much deeper sense of intimacy or sharing money and food and legal troubles um, and all sorts of things that, that is different from a sort of a house share. Uh, so for the most part, I think people spend some time getting to know their new residents, um, making sure you know, that they can make difficult decisions together, making sure that there's a sort of um, feeling of ease between them. Uh, and that's wonderful. And it comes with its problems, which is that um, that takes time and not everybody has time when they're looking for, for their new home. Um, and so I think it is wonderful and creative and generative and beautiful, and it comes with its problems. Um, and I think a lot of the, this can be solved by just having more, more options. Um, I think one of the many of the problems that come with community housing is that they're so they're so scarce, um, and uh, and I think if we had had more more range of spaces, um, things would start to get much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for naming all of those different tensions. I think it's. It's true. One of the, th the things that I try to emphasize to people in my matchmaking coaching sessions is you're not applying for a job. You're not applying to join a school. You're building a relationship with other people. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different process. And that's so cool like how you have that sort of centralized application form and then a distributed way to look mm -hmm. at it. And oh, so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. I, I often say, it, yeah, this is not an application form. This is more like dating. Um, yeah. And of course, dating comes with its own problems as well. <laughs> so yes, yeah, yeah. I think it helps communicate the process. Okay. And it's a two way thing, right? I think, you know, often um, the person is interviewing the house. You know, are you going to meet my needs? Are you going to be able to support me when I'm having a hard time? Mm -hmm. Two way thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of questions for you in the Q&A box. Um, I do have one more question I want to touch on, and I know we're coming up on the, on the time, but um, because you and Peter, so Anne, Anne had to leave. She said her goodbye in the chat. She had something else to get to, but um, so we have Zarina and Peter with us now. And I think both of you are in this interesting process of creating not just one community, but networks of communities. And so one of the questions that has come up in the Q&A for Zarina, but I think Peter, it could be for you as well. How does one go about expanding a network of communities and acquiring new locations? And especially how is that funded and financed, especially in a urban, you know, we already mentioned the cost of housing is outrageous. So how, how is that happening? You want to go first, Peter? Um, well, I think I'm probably in an easier position because uh, most of our centers start with a very strong monastic practice core. And uh, we basically, um, so the Oak 
location was originally seated because a, a friend of the community actually just let us use their two bedroom condo and said, you can just have this thing for however long. And so we're really grateful for that. And then the Willow location in Canada um, was actually a residential member guest who came here for several months and really wanted this in Canada. And she bought a house with her own money, got a mortgage with the idea that we would eventually expand there. But then we told her, why don't you be the teacher and why don't you become the leader? And so she did that. And this Maple location, uh, we purchased this property from a couple and we got about a million dollars in uh, family and friends loaning us money. So uh, we we're very grateful to have that community to give us those funds and we're still paying off that debt. Um, so it's pretty organic and uh, for us, very highly dependent on uh, having friends that want to support this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's the relationships. Yeah, I think that's that's been my experience often too. That um, you know, if you if you go community first, and that might be community first before you have a space, a physical space, um, uh, you can try and leverage the connections people have. Uh, I think this is it's not ideal because tons of people don't have those connections. Most of the world don't have those connections, and so it does you know, it does. I think relying on sort of benevolent philanthropy um, is a great place to start, and it's not available to everyone. Um, so I think, you know, HG Commons came about because, uh, you know, so I'm involved in some other projects that help, tries to help houses start. Um, but we really didn't want to sort of have like homogenized culture or like, you know, just like, mm, yeah, homogenized scaling. And so HG Commons was really about saying like, who's already out there? You, let's, let's federate. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, no, no one person started all of these houses. They're all self-determined and they're all autonomous. <clears throat> they all have their own sort of uh, structures and financial models and sources of funding. Um, and that's really helped us learn all the different ways that these things can start. Uh, I'll say that the couple of houses that I've been helping with in the, in the recent years, I, we tried to sort of start them on almost zero cost. <clears throat> and that has been, we have been successful on doing that, I think. Um, I recently helped set up a house and I think it cost us a thousand dollars, which I just put in the kitty myself and the rest we, we just did, um, you know, there wasn't really any cost apart from, from rent. We just relied on donations for furniture and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was a really good model because I think that really does re reduce the barriers. <clears throat> Actually, what I think is a huge barrier is getting a landlord to <laughs> lease to you. Um, when you don't earn enough money to cover, you know, 2x. Sometimes in San Francisco, landlords are expecting you each to earn 2x a monthly rent, which is just, you know, abominable. And so then we end up falling back into social relationships, which is, can you build a relationship with a landlord? We'll trust you, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think these are not just financial, like these are, um, you know, um, sort of citywide uh, legislation type problems as well. Mm. Hmm. Great. Whew, okay. Well, this has been incredibly rich. Thank you both. Thank you to everyone who is asking all these amazing questions. I'm really appreciative to you. We're doing these every month on the fourth Thursday of each and every month, always with three different communities. We're also looking for communities that would like to present. So it doesn't matter if you're a brand new community or you've been around for a long time, we wanna hear a diversity of different uh, voices from the network. And with that said, and as we're wrapping up, um, Zarina and Peter, we have in this audience, a lot of people who are looking to join intentional community and some of them are just at the early stages of that process and starting to explore and see what's out there. So I'm curious if either of you have one piece of advice or a mm. little nugget of wisdom you'd like to offer to these community seekers out there. I mean, I, I, oh, go ahead, Peter. Oh, well, off the top of my head. Uh, I guess I have the two come to mind. One is I've found in my experience, at least in talking to people and, and my personal life, is that intentional communities work best when the group is collectively dedicated to something larger than just themselves. 
and that there has to be some sort of common value or purpose um, or else eventually people change and you know, it doesn't work. And I would say just talk to everyone you can because I, I, when I talk to people, it seems like everyone wants to live in an intentional community. Um, so just getting the word out there and finding the, the people that are fit is I think half the work. Yeah, I think I'd say um, the thing that you can't buy is, is the people and the relationships. Um, and so I think I would say find your people and you don't have to find them all. Uh, you don't have to live with them all in the end, but find them. And that is non-trivial. Uh, so what I tell people to do is think about what your values are, think about what your interest is, think about what impact you want to have in the world, as Peter says, and then just, you know, like go to some meetups or host a book club, like uh, anything that gets people around the table or a potluck, a weekly or a monthly potluck and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking in like thinking about doing communal living. I'm not sure where, but like I'm going to host a communal living potluck once a month. See who comes, see what conversations come up uh, and start to build like an ecosystem of 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 kinship and friendships. And from that, you'll start to see a couple of people fall out that you're like, I think I could do this with you. And you only need two or three of, of you together to sort of seed. Uh, a project it's so much easier than trying to do it alone and then trying to have a bunch of people buy into your vision um, and so I think build your community first find your people first and those things can be very simple flyers in libraries um, going to sort of events where you might meet those kinds of uh, people and, and build those relationships and that can take six months like it can take a while to sort of build that ecosystem of shared values um, and then when you've got your couple of people, then you can be like, okay, where do we want to do this? What kind of building? Um, and the rest will come when you've got really good kinship. Mm, I love that word kinship as the foundation and yeah, find your people. Nice. That's a great people. Fun. Find your people. Beautiful. Okay. People out there will uh, see you next time. And uh, just appreciating you all so much. Take care, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.